wanted to provide a couple of updates about um, the most recent and upcoming Winter Lights events, um, talk a little bit about a uh, horticultural study that we did, um, and then um, have Stu join. He's going to talk a little bit about um, kind of winter interest horticulture. Um, so uh, on Winter Lights, um, we have been doing um, events, uh, thank you to the support of uh, the Integrated Design Group, um, financial support. We've been doing events on the Greenway. The most recent was the Color Commons event, um, and that was really very successful. That was the text to change the, the light blades, um, which that will be operating for the next three months. Um, we had about 100 people come out. It was um, really very successful. You can go out now, and um, there are something like 300 words that you can text. Um, Pick a color, any color, and it will um, change the change the light blade. There are also some, um, they call them Easter eggs, um, meaning uh, if you text, I'll, I'll give one away, if you text uh, Celtics, you get a particular pattern. Um, so it's, if you weren't able to make the event, um, drop by, it got, it got some nice press attention, um, and uh, we're, we're excited about that. <laughs> you gotta go check it out. Um, and then, uh, <clears throat> two upcoming events uh, in the Winter Lights series. Um, first is called uh, Frigid Phrases. Um, this is going to be um, a uh, kind of interactive Mad Libs event. So we are um, working with artists. We are giving out, um, they, they, local poets have written poems and like the old Mad Libs game, some words have been left out. Um, we're giving out gloves, which will be a keepsake from the artists. Um, that have words so that people can participate in making poems with the gloves, because each of the gloves will have a word on it. So come out, that is Wednesday, February 20th from 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, in, the, in the Wharf District Parks. Um, and then the, the, the fourth and final um, Winter Lights event is uh, Thursday, March 7th. This is called Urban Planning, and it will be um, 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, at Dewey Square, and um, <clears throat> this is, I, I, will, I will read the description of this one. Um, uh, Reimagine the communities that existed in the 1940s and 50s prior to an era of modernization that included the central artery construction, um, which would eventually evolve into the Big Dig and the Greenway. Join Lumen Collective, that's the artist group, um, in retracing the Greenway using LED rope light, lights to plot the buildings that formerly stood on the square. Um, so very interesting, um, very site-specific um, use of light um, by March 7th. Um, hopefully the weather will be even more welcoming. Um, so uh, hope you can join for that as well. Uh, moving from winter lights to horticulture. Um, we, uh, Stu will talk about winter horticulture, we'll, which will keep that. Uh, but we worked this fall with a Harvard Kennedy School team. Um, and wanted to update the board on that. Um, this was a, a student project for, project for an operations class, and they worked um, with Stu and the horticulture team to evaluate the efficiency of our organic operation. Um, so they both uh, uh, mapped the process and made specific recommendations about ways that it could be uh, made more efficient. So for example, there is some field record keeping that they suggested we could use technology to so that it wasn't um, done in the field, then brought back to the office and retyped in. And so Stu and his team have already begun implementing um, that suggestion. Um, a second part to this study, which I think is, is uh, even more interesting, is that they looked at the uh, costs of the organic approach that are used, is used on the Greenway um, versus a non-organic approach and found that the organic approach is cheaper. Um, and the, uh, I mean, there clearly are environmental benefits and there are externalized costs, um, but even apart from those things, just the day-to-day -day cost uh, of an organic approach is cheaper. And the, the simplest way, I think, to understand this, and Stu, you should certainly correct if, if, uh, if I'm oversimplifying, but um, the, a non-organic approach involves um, applying something just as the organic approach does. So on that measure, it is comparable. Um, but the non-organic approach uh, involves the purchase of 
pesticides, chemicals, etc. And the organic approach, since we brew compost tea, um, involves the purchase of oats and molasses and worms and things like that that are cheaper. Um, and so it's uh, something that um, a practice chosen long ago because it was the right thing to do. Um, we've long believed with the, with the kind of uh, intuition that I laid out there that this was in fact cheaper um, in a day-to-day -day way but that um, it is, you know, it is nice to work with a team of qualified, um, uh, a qualified team to um, work through that with us and give an external opinion that um, with some interviews they did with experts and so on that um, it is in fact in their preliminary estimation cheaper. Um, there are of course equipment costs and startup costs and so on. You can be somewhere along the curve in terms of gearing up, but in terms of what you're putting in um, day to day, year to year. Um, that was a, a great finding. With that, um, I'd love to, to turn over to, to Stu, who's going to give um, uh, a little bit of a virtual tour of the Wharf District um, horticulture. Um, you know, we have a few times in the past um, invited people after the meeting to go out to the Greenway and take a tour of some location there. Um, in the winter, that's a, we didn't think very many of you would take us up on that. Um, and so we thought that a tour in photographs um, of some of the Wharf District horticulture so that you could understand a little bit better what um, the design implications or the operational implications of some design differences out there. Um, with that, I will hand off to Stu. Unless there are any questions about either winter lights or the, the study. Hi, I'm Stu. <laughs> um, Stu Schillover, Superintendent of Horticulture with the Conservancy. Um, sort of clearly the business part of the meeting I think is, is drawing to a close and I hope to add to that a little bit as I ask you to just kind of relax in your chairs and settle back as you <laughs> take a little stroll through an important part of the Greenway, uh, the Wharf District Parks. And um, you know, you'll, you'll see in some of these images, uh, we'll harken back to the warmer days of summer, uh, the beautiful colors of fall. but. Um, this was also an opportunity to just uh, share a little insight on some of our uh, current maintenance practices that, we, uh, that are going on horticulturally on the Greenway and um, let folks know, you know, why do we take a certain approach to doing things um, a certain way. And, uh, you know, first and foremost, it's under the, the idea, as Jesse said, about winter interest. Um, it's a term that we often use in landscape design, um, we use it horticulturally, and it's implying to, to just that, you know, what do you find to be interesting in the cold, dark days of winter. And it can be hard. Um, so it requires a lot of thought um, in the design process, the introduction of uh, appropriate plants that provide um, that interest. Um, and what we do uh, to enhance that is to allow much of our landscapes to remain in place this time of year. And often you'll see um, in the, it's a common practice, you may have all employed Landscapers have done it yourself in your own backyards and it's perfectly acceptable, but the idea of cutting a lot of your perennials and grasses and, and those type of plants back in the fall, um, which is fine, um, I'll only add, I hope you're composting all that material if you are, um, but that, that's just one approach and it's, it's practiced regularly. Landscape companies come in and you know you hire them, they'll clean your backyard and they'll cut everything down and take care of the leaves and stuff like that. Um, it's fine to do that. You'll see in some of the images we do a little comparison um, it is practiced, um, and excuse me, Daryl, kindly driving this, um, go forward. Just to see this is parcel 14 uh, in the summer, showing you know, the dense uh, plantings buffering the street um, on the east side of the Harbor Island Pavilion. You can go forward with that, Daryl. Parcel 15, um, perhaps I've been sabotaged here by the maintenance department for paying respects to that wonderful uh, trash can that's prominently displayed in the front of the photograph, but uh, the, the real intention for this is to uh, look at the, uh, the bed that's um, in the background, and that's the uh, parcel 15 bed um, that was the recipient of uh, Pat Kalina's design that we installed, and really a, a representation of four seasons of interest. Um, we've got you know, the spring blooming uh, bulbs, which is soon to come up uh, the spring, summer, summer perennials, goes into great fall color, and, and we'll see in winter interest if you could again. Um, 
parts of 17 in and around the Harbor Fog area. And these are all, you know, representing dense peat, summer color, summer foliage, um, summer vegetation. Again, thanks. Um, here's the uh, parcel 13, our neighbors um, across the street from the Carousel, the Armenian Heritage Memorial, um, the use of their perennials, and you can see the variety down in the front foreground. I think we have some nepeta there, I can't quite tell in the image, but dense plantings. Um, but if you go to the next image, without those very same plantings, and that's the practice that, um, that was utilized there, and cutting everything back hard to the ground makes for great uh, you know, winter care and, and cleanup. Um, you don't have a lot of uh, uh, you know, trash uh, catchers, so to speak, with the vegetation and stuff. But um, clearly, I think you can see that there was you know, definitely a lot of ground covered before the plants. And in this image, you um, see a lot of open space. And again, and you see that, uh, again, in the foreground, probably uh, <coughs> guessing maybe liriope that was planted there. Uh, looks in, in the back. Uh, back left of the image, um, you can see a uh, probably a stand in the scamp is grass, which was you know three to four feet tall. Um, when it's uh, in vegetation here, it's been been cut back. Um, if we want to yeah, go the other way, there. So then we've got parcel 14 um, coming out of summer, um, clearly in fall, devoid of a lot of the foliage, but you can see that you know there's a reliance on woody plants in there that provide the buffer and give us some of the interest against what would otherwise be an empty landscape. We can go ahead. Here's parcel 14 again, uh, coming all the way up into our current favorite season of winter. Um, and the woody structure is an important part. And this is really sort of the you know one of the classic images of trying to get the you know the snow on the plants and, and what is that black and white image that it creates the contrast and the silhouette of the plant material. Forward. Um, back to uh, parcel 15 uh, at the Mother's Walk. Again, using, uh, we've got Joe Pye in the foreground, and mountain mint, and, uh, echinacea, there's grasses, and all sorts of fantastic stuff in there. And we go forward, um, close up of the echinacea. This is a perfect example of a flowering perennial that uh, you would very much want to leave. Um, the petals, the white petals will drop, but the dark centers to the plant become the interest in the wintertime, and they can provide that uh, um, that contrast against the snow that you might not get if you come back. Um, we've got plethora with the pink blooms in bloom, again the echinacea, the Indian grass, um, things in the foreground, the baptisia. Go ahead. Um, starting to come out of the summer a little bit in this image. Um, I think this shot was maybe taken in uh, mid-September. Um, things are starting to transition over to the next season coming up. Go ahead. Um, definitely starting to take on more of a fallish appearance. Um, but again, it's still chocolate luck gold. And clearly, we're in fall now. Um, things that weren't even um, in bloom before, you know, with the proper design, um, planning for things to continually provided as four seasons of interest. Obviously, we're getting foliage color, but we've got asters that have come into bloom now that uh, provide the purple color. Up close, asters, plethora, um, father viola in the back, the leaves are turning the uh, bright red and orange. Um, one more image again, set back a little bit, parcel 15. But here, it just contrast too, if you go back one. So that would be 15. And if you can imagine if we were to practice that technique, and these are all um, plants that could be cut to the ground, and we will do this in the springtime. Um, this, there is that one effort you do need to make annually, whether you choose to do it in the spring, just preceding the, you know, the plants uh, emerging again, or if you choose to do it in the fall. And when we take the approach of trying to do this in the spring, we allow uh, interest for people to observe. We fill empty voids, um, also a great win in that um, we're providing wildlife habitat too, with seed heads and, and structure and, and hiding places for birds to uh, to winter. So if you go forward, I think really that's the same same spot. And if that technique of cutting all those plants down to the ground in the fall, we would be looking at a pretty stark plane there. So it's um, it's something that 
we practice here on the Greenway, we encourage people to do. Um, the, the horse staff loves talking about horticulture to people uh, in passing on the Greenway, and we're always promoting our organics and promoting this this mindset here. And, uh, continue forward if you want. Close up, uh, Rose of Virginiana, uh, native rose. All, all the plantings in the war are native to the northeast United States, but you know, I mentioned before about the echinacea and the perennial. Um, you know, what you're looking for is that seed head in the, in the middle. Um, here, it's a case of the fruit. These are the rose hips. Um, small, but uh, you know, noticeable. And uh, again, if, uh, if cut back, not there to observe and, uh, and enjoy this time of year. Mm -hmm. Birds love those fruit. You're right, Helen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely great example. Um, I think we've got uh, possibly the echinacea there, or it could be some um, Rebecca, I'm not sure, but you know, you just see. It, it is something that we, I will say, we don't um, completely let everything go. In the fall, there are certain plants that don't have that internal structure um, that allow them to you know, remain upright. Um, so that's something that we do have to be careful of. Day lilies are a good example. They do have that tendency to just sort of melt into the ground. And you know, you're sort of in one of those winters right now where you don't have the snow cover to potentially hide some of your mistakes or your, or your unattractive plants. So, um, we, we do have to cut some stuff back, and it is done um, throughout all the parks uh, to a degree, some in more areas than other. But, um, you know, this is just an example of, of leaving this stuff up to, uh, to enjoy. And we have a couple more images. Parcel uh, 17, just south of um, the Harbor Island Fog, again, you know, lush, full summer grasses to the left, uh, evergreen junipers to the left, uh, yellow root to the right above the wall, and what else we have? Again, midsummer, late summer, parcel 17, same spot, just a little south, looking eastward. That same area, looking at from a distance across the lawn, we're on the promenade right now, looking east. Um, clearly, we can start to see the yellowing and bronzing uh, for fall color. Again, um, yep, a little closer to the Harbor Island Fog. Um, a lot of the plants that you see in the foreground, Liatris on the right, the tip of the uh, um, little island bed. Uh, you know, easily can, can cut it back, but uh, we're still enjoying it right there for structure and, and form. And I think the next shot will say, uh, okay, we're obviously just a couple of weeks uh, even further past that, some iris in the front, asters that are uh, getting ready to uh, go into winter. And there's that same location again, just taking advantage of, um, of using the plants that you have there, trying to get a full year out of them. Maybe one more, you yeah, know, just another close-up of the grasses. It, it, it is a fine line. We do have to go out periodically um, to adjust. Things have a, you know, that tipping point where they're, okay, they're on track. You know, we do want to promote the sustainability. We do want to promote winter interest and in wildlife habitat. But clearly, you know, we, um, we have a public park and we need to um, think of the aesthetics at all times. But, um, you know, we'll let some stuff go. After a heavy storm, we, you know, we have to go out broken limbs on trees from wet snow, or if it's uh, um, things that's you know, getting too trampled by the heavy snow. But a little bit about what we're doing right now. Um, hopefully that was a nice little break to remind you of the warmer months to pass or to come. And uh, again, hopefully uh, something that you can think about for your own landscapes. Yeah, that's it. Questions? So procrastination in the fall is all part of It's fine. Perfect. You're doing it just right. Did, did you take the pictures? I didn't. Uh, a couple images uh, could be from various staff members, but primarily um, one of the staff members on the horticulture uh, staff. We photograph the Greenway um, the entire plant collections. All our all our species of plants are basically photographed um, once a week for the better part of nine to ten months a year, um, and that's under the heading of phenology. And what we're trying to do in that effort is to record the bloom sequence of plants, when particular varieties of plants are in bloom, and what stages of bloom they're going. Um, where it's you know, bud, bud swell, bud open, full flower, decline kind of thing. It's, it's just great information um, that helps us uh, know our plants, prepare for um, when we're coming out of a winter early as we were last year. Um, we needed to get our spring cleanups done. We needed to get mulch in certain areas, but we had to recognize, for example, where were our daffodils? Where did we plant them? You know, And often we can uh, refer to our photographs um, clearly will help us in our in our uh, parcel maps. Um, 
so that saved us so, uh, getting those areas done where we had a lot of daffodils we were going to get the mulching done uh, sooner rather than later because um, we know we didn't want to step on those plants in the image. But uh, yeah, so that was taken uh, most, uh, by Dara, Dara Cole. Oh, yes. Yeah, Dara Cole. Um, in addition to uh, documenting all our plants, Dara's the one responsible on our staff for uh, all our lovely container design. Else. I was walking in the greenway one day and I saw a rabbit. Great. Great. I mean, we're, how are they living in the You know, it word gets out that we've got a good thing here. <laughs> and uh, slowly <laughs> but surely they're moving into the neighborhood. Um, I've never seen that. I, I, yeah, I we've seen, uh, things are moving up the food chain. We've seen rabbits, um, we've seen we've seen red tail hawks. <laughs> Day after, the day after we installed the rain garden um, in the geese, uh, coyote was even witnessed. Uh, so they're here. You did see a coyote in uh, Boston. Uh, it was actually in the vicinity of India Wharf on a Saturday, briefly, and then headed into town. He was out of his element. So. Took the subway. He did. We should all look for the ground following. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had any problem with the turkey? Well, they are so urban. Probably um, a little too much for them. Uh, you know, habitat is still important as much as we are providing all this wonderful stuff, and it is growing, maturing. It's probably you know they do need that uh, that wooded edge to retreat into, and we don't have that yet. Um, another interesting thing: our, our trees haven't. They're growing. Uh, believe me, they are growing indeed. Um, but they haven't gotten big enough to support the squirrel population yet, so we haven't seen those. But uh, this stuff is coming. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Shirley, we're, we're having a board meeting here that, um, yeah, I don't think you were here in the beginning, but we're doing, um, this is an open meeting, um, but it's not a public meeting in the sense that we're not going to be taking, um, we're just sitting around the table having a board meeting, um, allowing everybody to hear what we're saying. But so, so this is just a board meeting. So there will no longer be a chance for public questions? There will be at several times a year, like we did before, but there will be, but we need to be able to meet as a board. Um, Uh, we are going to experiment and have some just board meetings and some open to the public. Um, so this is the first experiment of having one um, a board meeting. So any questions anybody has? It's really good, Stu. Thank you. It really is. I was kidding about being lazy because I know I know I have to do it in the spring, but, um, but I didn't get to it this fall. Um, I, I somehow thought it would be damaging to do that, apparently not. Well, well, yes, then you have to. Thanks, we'll be trying to make it all easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so that, that concludes our program for tonight. Um, we, we, um, you know, we never know how many questions will be, so you know, we say 5.30 to 7.30, which is always nice to get out of um, So we'll do that. And uh, we will be in touch, but uh, thank you very much.